Good morning again. So today is week 11. There's a new phase in our life in linear algebra. But before that, let's take a quick look at where we are in our linear algebra journey. We started way back when we were really young with the notion of linearity and how that led to the concept of vectors and matrices and then some basic operations, the foundations in the first couple of weeks. Then we moved on to the algebraic view, which was about solving Ax equal to b. So we did Gaussian elimination, Gauss-Jordan elimination, defined entities like ranks, inverses, and looked at the solvability of uh, different shapes of matrices, etc. And then we graduated to the geometric view, which is like uh, a superior view. So that involved vector spaces, bases of vector spaces, changes between bases. Then the four fundamental subspaces given by a matrix, the column space, the row space, the null space, the left null space. After that, just last week, we uh, investigated how to project any given vector to the column space of a matrix and how that makes things solvable. And then we reached an important milestone at that point, which is the application of that idea, the geometric view, in something that is really tangible in uh, computer science, which is this, uh, very commonly used algorithm called linear regression, which is a uh, a predictive analytics tool, a supervised learning algorithm in uh, machine learning. And that, at least for me, was a very satisfying moment because I could show you that all these ab abstract things that you were learning had some value in uh, your real life. So that's where we stopped last week. And this week, we're going to move on to the advanced topics, the so-called advanced topics. But these topics are really not very advanced from the point of view of computer science because these are the things that will be used almost every single data science kind of application algorithm all these ideas that are coming up uh, today and the next two weeks will be used so eigenvalue decomposition is the first one and that will lead to something else called singular value decomposition the identification of uh, components or directions in the data space that explains or contains the largest variance in the data and using the linear combinations that will give you the largest variance in the data, you can start reducing the dimensionality of your data science problem. Dimensionality reduction is an important step in uh, all kinds of uh, data science applications, real projects. So that becomes something like almost like the first step that you would do in any kind of a data science uh, project. All those things are coming up. They are advanced only in a sense that mathematically, those things have to come only after all these things are done so but they're not advanced in terms of uh, how they are actually used in computer science okay so that's our learning journey the objectives for today would be to understand eigenvalues and eigenvectors and to define them to describe the significance of uh, the concepts behind the eigen analysis and actually perform eigen analysis for small matrices and then from there use eigenvalue decomposition which is a way of writing a matrix in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So that is a decomposition. And that is called, the, the process is called diagonalization. So the con conditions for a matrix to be able to be diagonalized, that is the diagonalizability, and why that is used. Now, let's take a step back and look at a matrix as a transformation between spaces. That's the way we did when we were talking about uh, Ax equal to b. So if you take a matrix A and then think of Ax equal to b, x is the input and b is the output. x belongs to Rn if the matrix is an m by n matrix, m rows and n columns. So it's a ma mapping between Rn, taking vectors in Rn and giving you vectors in Rn. It's a mapping from Rn to Rm. It's a transformation between two spaces. So that's the way we looked at it. Now, if you take a square matrix, then the input space is Rn, the out output space also is Rn. So in principle, if you think of it uh, as an extension of the first statement, that these are actually two different Rns. But then since they are both Rns, we can think of it as the same Rn. So in other words, you can think of A as though it is taking a vector in Rn and transforming it in some way and giving you another vector in the same space. So let me give you some examples though, to begin with. If you think of permutation, that is, it takes a vector and it uh, shuffles the elements and it gives it back to you. So that we saw, we had permutation matrices. Then we had the projection operator, which also takes a vector in Rn and gives you another vector in Rn, which is actually a member of a subspace, but it's still a vector in Rn. So if you take a three-dimensional vector in Rn and project it to the xy plane, I get a vector and that vector that I get, the projection that I get, so it's got three components, even though the last component is actually zero. Then there's another class of uh, uh, matrices, 
an operation that does what they call shearing. It returns a vector with one element changed proportional to another element. So uh, we will see an example, then you will understand what I mean by that. So what it will do is to take something like a unit square and then give you a parallelogram that is actually a squashed version of uh, the unit square. So that's why it's called shearing. Then rotation is another example that we saw. It also takes a vector and gives you another vector in the same space, but at a different angle, pointing in a different direction without changing the the magnitude or the norm of the vector. So these are the different examples. Uh, any matrix that is a, a square matrix will be a ma mapping from one space to itself. And I think that mapping is called, if I remember right, automorphism. Now we can ask one question at this point. Are there some vectors that do not change the direction because of the transformation? In other words, I take a vector, all vectors go to some random vectors or some vectors defined by the matrix, but are there some special vectors that stay in the same direction, but they just get scaled? So these vectors do not change direction. I put direction in uh, quotation marks because in linear algebra, as it is applied in uh, various fields, vectors may not be vectors with numbers, columns, or things in coordinate space where you can actually think of a direction. So that is, uh, that's the question that we are asking. So let's think about uh, what no change in direction means. That means what you're getting is a scale version of the vector. In other words, suppose you take a vector S and you have a square matrix and you apply the square matrix to the vector S and you get a scale version. Let's call the scaling factor lambda. So you get AS, which is the application of the matrix on the vector S. What you're getting is lambda times S, where lambda is just a member of, uh, it's a real number. It's a member of R. So are there vectors like that? And those vectors, are called eigenvectors and the corresponding value lambda is called the eigenvalue. So that's the definition. So let's look at a few examples before we proceed. Permutation. So if you have a matrix 0, 1, 1, 0, and if you apply it to a vector x, y, x and y standing in a column, a, which is, uh, and I want to take a, x, this is going to be equal to y, x. It just shuffles the elements. So it's the permutation matrix y that the first element is a 0 times x plus 1 times y, so that is y. The second element is a 1 times x plus 0 times y, that is x. Given that, can you think of a vector that will not change by the application of a? Obviously, if x and y are the same, 1 and 1, then what you're getting is going to be the same because it changes 1, which shuffles x and y, but they are both 1, so you get the same thing back. So that is an eigenvector of this matrix with the eigenvalue 1 because when you multiply, you get the same vector back. Now, if you have 1 and minus 1 on the other hand, when you shuffle these two, you will get minus 1 and 1 because x becomes y and y, y becomes x. So which is the same as minus 1 times the original vector. So what I'm saying is if I take a times 1 minus 1, what I'll get is a minus 1, 1. But this is the same as minus 1 times 1 minus 1. So this is in the form a s is equal to lambda s. s is uh, this vector or this vector and lambda is minus 1. So two eigenvectors and two eigenvalues. Now if you take projection, if you project to the x y plane, so it's a 3 by 3 matrix, a square matrix still, the matrix, what that matrix does, if I multiply that matrix by x y z, it takes x of the first column, y of the second column, z of the third column, but the third column is already zero, so z becomes zero. So I'll get just xy, and any vector xy zero will not change because it's already on the xy plane, and that will stay the same because I'm projecting onto the xy plane. So that will have an eigenvalue one. So all vectors on the xy plane will be eigenvectors, the whole of xy plane. Now there is another eigenvector, that is I take any vector along the z-axis, that will become zero, it'll become zero, 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 and that is an eigenvector with the eigenvalue 0. So eigenvalues are allowed to be 0, but eigenvectors are not allowed to be 0. Eigenvalues can be 0. So in this case, the second eigenvalue is actually 0. Now, it looks as though we don't have eigenvectors corresponding to lambda equal to 1, but you can take any vector. So typically, you would take the basis of uh, the xy plane. The best basis would be 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, and that would be the Eigen uh, vectors corresponding to lambda equal to 1. So the whole xy plane is a space spanned by two eigenvectors. So we'll call that actually eigenspace. Now, shear matrix, that is interesting. That takes a square and gives you a parallelogram. So an example is there 1, 0, point, 
five, one. And let me show you what the matrix is. Well, what it does is uh, fairly obvious. A, one, zero, point five, one. So A, X is a linear combination of the columns. The first one is a uh, one, zero, that becomes X, zero. And I'm adding to that point five times Y and one times Y. So the X component will become X plus point five Y. And the Y component will, will become zero plus y so the y component stays put and the x component changes in proportion to y component so i have in order to understand what any matrix does to the whole space you would start with the, the columns of the identity matrix the unit vectors and we'll see what the matrix does to those vectors so if i take q1 and i say that that doesn't change but q2 becomes a 0 0.5 and 1 that's what the matrix does the columns of the matrix were 1 0 and 0 0.5 1 but that's what it does so q1 prime the transformed q1 is the same as the original q1 but q2 became slanted so if you think about the the unit square there what happens to that is that it becomes a slanted sheared kind of a shape it becomes a parallelogram that is a shear matrix that's why it's called the shear matrix let's just take uh, 0 1 and apply the matrix A to it, we know that it changes X in proportion to Y, but Y is zero here. So X doesn't change. So X was one, X is going to stay as one and Y just stays put. So one zero will stay as one zero. I have my A there. I'm going to take S, which was one zero. A S is going to be, it is one times the first column and zero times the second column, one zero. So Lambda is equal to one and S the eigenvector is just one zero but unfortunately in this case we could find only one eigenvector for a two by two matrix we would like to see two eigenvectors but here there is only one which is important keep that in mind just to remind you rotation matrix is a an orthogonal matrix so that the transpose is the same as the inverse and it's got trigonometric uh, functions inside let me just show you why this is true again in order to see what the matrix does we will see what it does to the unit vectors so q1 is 1 0 and q2 is a 0 1 those are the columns of the identity matrix if i'm rotating the unit vectors the tip of the rotated version will be on that unit circle if i rotate it by theta counterclockwise my transformed vector corresponding to q1 becomes cos theta sine theta by the fact that the norm of the red vector norm of all vectors on the unit circle is 1 and by basic trigonometry you know that adjacent side is called cosine and uh, opposite side is a uh, sine so you get that similarly the blue vector rotating by theta will give you minus sine theta cos theta so the rotation matrix is actually what it does to the first unit vector cos theta sine theta what it does to the second unit vector minus sine theta cos theta now you can ask the question for non-trivial by non-trivial i mean it is a two pi rotation it comes back to the same position so that doesn't change anything but non trivial, something like say pi by 2 or some random angle that is not an integer multiple of 2 pi, you will have a rotation matrix and all vectors in the plane are going to be rotated. Now, given that all vectors are, are going to be rotated, there are no vectors that will retain their original orientation or angle. So, this matrix does not have any eigenvectors. So, all vectors are changed. So, there are no eigenvectors, but we will say that no real eigenvectors. We will see why later. The notion of uh, eigen analysis is not confined to vectors in the coordinate space where you have direction and angles. They are also applicable to vectors that are more abstract, like uh, wave functions or functions. So one such example here for calculus differentiation, if you think of that as a linear operator or apply being applied on a vector, which is just a function, this particular function, e to the power ax, if you differentiate it, a just comes out and what you get a is just e. So that function as a vector is an eigenvector of this differentiation operator with the eigenvalue which is a. Similarly, if you think of the second uh, derivative of a trigonometric function like sin x, it is just minus sin x. So you get sin x back with an eigenvalue minus one. So sin x is an eigenvector of a second derivative with an eigenvalue minus one. So let me define this once more for a matrix, a square matrix of size n by n, a vector in Rn is called an eigenvector with an eigenvalue lambda, which is a real value. Actually, I should relax this. For now, let's stay with uh, real values. If I can write As is equal to lambda times S for a non-zero vector S, then S is a, an eigenvector and lambda is a corresponding eigenvalue. Now, one thing to note is that if S is an eigenvector, 
with a particular eigenvalue. Any scale version of uh, S, so let's say R times S, is also an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. If I take A times uh, Rs, R just comes out, that becomes A R times As, and As we know is lambda S because S is an eigenvector. So it becomes lambda times Rs. So if you think of Rs as another vector, that also is an eigenvector of A with the same eigenvalue. That basically means eigenvectors define only directions. We are not really interested in the magnitude. So for that reason, we will typically just normalize the eigenvector. So if you do it in sage math, I believe you will always get uh, the normalized version of the eigenvector. Now another thing is that uh, lambda can be zero as we saw in the projection matrix projecting to the xy plane. And if it happens to be zero, what it's saying is that uh, a times s is the zero vector, which means s is a member of the null space of that matrix. So any matrix that has a null space will have a bunch of eigenvectors in the null space. But s is never a zero vector, much like uh, for the null space also we're looking for non-trivial vectors that are in the solution set. So here I'm relaxing the statement that for a real matrix in R n by n, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues may be complex. Let's take a look at how to compute eigenvalues, how to perform the eigen analysis. So we'll start from the definition. So what we will do is uh, take a matrix and we'll say that S is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda and S is not equal to zero. And we will just write A is equal to lambda S and we'll try to take lambda S to the left hand side and we want to pull out S eigenvector. You want to pull that out. And then what do you get? You get A minus lambda times I times S. Why do we get I there? Because if you not take A minus lambda, because A is a matrix and lambda is just a number. So in order to be able to subtract it, you have to actually multiply by the identity matrix. And then you get A minus lambda I times S is equal to zero. That is the requirement for, uh, for eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So, but what does that say? What it is saying is that some matrix lam A minus lambda I is some matrix times, times S equal to zero, where S is not a zero vector. What's that saying? That's basically saying that that matrix that is multiplying S is a singular matrix because a non-zero S multiplying that matrix is giving you zero. So the columns of the matrix are not linearly independent. They are linearly dependent. So it's a singular matrix. What do we know about singular matrices? We know that its determinant has to be zero. We know that the determinant of whatever is multiplying S here will have to be zero. So we can just write that. And now S has disappeared. There's no S there. The eigenvector is not there in this equation. And what is this equation? It's a determinant. And we know all the numbers in uh, the matrix A, the square matrix. So we know all the numbers in I, it's just ones and up along the diagonal. And lambda is the only unknown n by n matrix. You can expand it along the, the top row, for instance, and it becomes a polynomial. So this determinant equation there, determinant equal to zero, is the same as a polynomial equal to zero, is an equation that says a polynomial on lambda equal to zero. That polynomial, which is on lambda, is called the characteristic polynomial for the eigenvalues. If you can solve that polynomial, then you get all the eigenvalues. Theoretically, at least mathematically, that's how you do it. Practical eigenvalues are computed using a completely different methods, but this is the mathematical way of doing it. A determinant equal to zero, determinant expands, and that gives you a polynomial equal to zero. A polynomial is on lambda, and just find the roots of the polynomial, and that's it. Those are the values, those are the eigenvalues. Okay, so we have to remember that this is the characteristic polynomial for the eigenvalues. By the way, the word eigen is a German word. It actually means characteristic in German. So, but nobody calls it characteristic vectors and values in uh, English. We use eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But for the polynomial, you don't call it eigen polynomial. At least I don't think people usually call it eigen polynomial. We call it the characteristic polynomial. But if you hear eigen polynomial, somebody calling it eigen polynomial, probably because he's got German heritage or whatever, know that this is what they mean. Just stating that the determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to zero, that is the polynomial. No, that's the polynomial equal to zero, so that's the equation. The left hand side is the polynomial. Okay, so let's actually apply this and see how it works out for the examples that we did earlier. So we take the permutation matrix, a is there, and if I take a minus lambda i, what that means is that I subtract lambda from the diagonal elements. So I get lambda there, lam minus lambda there, minus lambda there, wherever I see zero along the diagonal. And if I expand it, what do I get? It's uh, the determinant is lambda square minus one equal to zero. That is the characteristic equation. Polynomial here and the equation there. 
and the roots of uh, that would be lambda square equal to 1 so lambda is plus or minus 1 those are the the eigenvalues that we got for the permutation matrix and in order to get the, the eigenvectors we take one of them we take uh, lambda equal to 1 and just put lambda equal to 1 in uh, a minus uh, lambda i so you get wherever you see lambda there you get 1 so minus 1 minus 1 and uh, 1 and 1 and you want this a minus lambda i times s equal to 0 how do you get 0 out of this what kind of linear combination of the columns will give you 0 just add them so the the vector that is multiplying this to get the 0 vector would be just 1 and 1 so take the first one and uh, take the second one add them and that linear combination will give you 0 so the eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1 is equal to 1 is just 1 1 similarly if you take lambda equal to minus 1 wherever you see lambda you put uh, minus 1 so you get uh, 1 1 and 1 1 matrix is uh, singular if you do gaussian elimination you just subtract the first row from the second you get 0 0 all those things the second row is pivotless but can you tell me why this guy is singular is it singular to begin with and if so why it has to be singular because we found lambdas such that the matrix is singular so when you take a minus lambda i for the solutions of the characteristic equation you have to have singular matrices good so here we get two eigenvectors in r2 which is pretty good and we have r2 matrices two by two matrix and we are looking for two eigenvectors and two eigenvalues very nice now we can see that these two eigenvectors s1 and s2 are actually orthogonal to each other if you just take s1 transpose s2 you get 1 times 1 minus 1 times 1 so it's 0 so the dot product is 0 so they're orthogonal that is not an accident it is because all real symmetric matrices have full set of orthogonal eigenvectors full set means if it is an n by n matrix i have n eigenvectors and they're orthogonal to real symmet symmetric matrices are the good members of the family of matrices they're not quite the kings but they are supposed to be the king yeah like maybe like the prince now let's take uh, the projection matrix so that is the projection matrix by the way is the projection matrix uh, real and symmetric so it is real and symmetric it's obvious it's right there it's a diagonal matrix and if i take if i subtract lambda i from it i would be subtracting uh, lambda from the diagonal element so i get one minus lambda one minus lambda and minus lambda and if i take the determinant that would be just the product of the diagonal elements because everything else is zero if i get that lambda times one minus lambda square equal to zero now i get lambda the solutions would be lambda equal to zero or lambda equal to one or lambda equal to one so lambda equal to one comes with a multiplicity of two and that multiplicity because it is coming from the characteristic polynomial is called the algebraic multiplicity so lambda equal to one has an algebraic multiplicity of two lambda equal to zero has an algebraic multiplicity of one because it's only one so lambda square equal to zero is lambda equal to zero with that we can easily find the eigenvector because you just put lambda equal to zero you get one one zero and what multiplies one one zero to give you zero vector so you have to multiply the first one by zero the second one by zero and the third one you can multiply by anything because that is already zero so zero zero one multiplying this guy will give me a zero vector so that would be an eigenvector now about the other eigenvalue lambda equal to one if i do that i can multiply the first column by anything second column by anything and the third column has to be multiplied by zero because there's a one there and then i'll get a zero vector that means my second eigenvector is some number and some other number x and y and zero in the z position now it is not just a vector but it is actually a whole plane of vectors it's a large number of vectors anything in the x y plane really is an eigenvector so we can actually choose the vectors out of this uh, space subspace that is the the space of eigenvectors obviously it's called the eigenspace for lambda equal to one so you can choose any two orthogonal uh, basis vectors out of them so the most obvious one to choose would be the x vector and the y vector the unit vectors along x axis and y axis if i do that then those are orthogonal to each other so i have to kind of modify my statement that said for a real symmetric matrix you have a full set of orthogonal eigenvectors what i mean is that you can choose vectors if you have an eigenspace and choose vectors such that you have a full set of orthogonal eigenvectors now the dimensionality of the eigenspace is called the geometric multiplicity because it's about the space the good thing here is that the algebraic multiplicity is 2 the geometric multiplicity corresponding to the same eigenvalue is also 2 so 2 and 2 that is a good case now the shear and rotation matrices let's take a look at those 
the shear matrix was that and if I do a minus lambda i to get the characteristic polynomial and equation what I get is uh, in the diagonal I get 1 minus lambda 1 minus lambda and 1 minus lambda whole square is equal to 0 because 1 minus lambda times 1 lambda minus lambda minus 0 times 0.5 that is a determinant so I get lambda equal to 1 and 1 similar to the projection matrix that we looked at with the algebraic multiplicity of 2 so that doesn't bother us much now if you put lambda equal to 1 you get uh, that matrix because wherever you see lambda you put 1 so 1 minus 1 and you can see that in order to get a 0 out of uh, this matrix you just have to take any multiple of uh, the first column and the 0 multiple of the second column so that is an eigenvector but you cannot find another eigenvector there's only one eigenvector here there's no other eigenvector but the geometric multiplicity is actually one so that is a bad situation saying that the geometric multiplicity is one is the same as saying that there's only one eigenvector shear matrix is a kind of matrix that does not have full set of eigenvectors and that's it so algebraic multiplicity is not geometric multiplicity this situation is a bad situation now if you look at rotation this is rotation for pi by 2 is q-symmetric, it's anti-symmetric, which means A transpose is minus A. And if you do the characteristic polynomial, which is the determinant of A minus lambda i, you get lambda square plus 1. So lambda times lambda minus lambda times minus lambda, that is lambda square, minus 1 times minus 1, that is lambda square plus 1 equal to 0. So you get lambda is equal to plus or minus i. So we're stepping in the scary field of uh, complex numbers here. And if you actually plot along and actually plug in the value i and try to compute the eigenvectors, then you get the first eigenvector to be 1 minus i, the second eigenvector to be 1, 1 i, etc. So you get complex vectors also. So the vectors are in uh, C2, not R2. So it is like the opposite of the symmetric case. In symmetric case, we had real eigenvalues and real Q-symmetric matrices will have purely imaginary eigenvalues. All right, let's move on to the properties of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So these properties are quite interesting. The first one says that the sum of eigenvalues is actually the trace of the matrix. Trace, if you remember, is just a sum of the diagonal elements of the matrix. And the statement is that the sum of the eigenvalues is actually the trace of the matrix. The proof is uh, interesting so if you think about the characteristic polynomial well assume that you have the eigenvalues lambda i then the, the roots of the characteristic polynomial will have to be the same as the, the eigenvalues so what i'm saying is that the roots of the characteristic polynomial will have to be lambda i because lambda i are the eigenvalues so characteristic polynomial is a polynomial on lambda so if i have lambda minus lambda one times lambda minus lambda 2 times all the way up to lambda minus lambda n equal to 0 and if I if I were to expand the factors there lambda minus lambda 1 etc I would get a polynomial of the order n what are the roots of this particular polynomial it will be lambda i lambda 1 lambda 2 etc because for any one of them at least one of the factors will be 0 the whole polynomial will be 0 so that, those are the roots so this is one way of implementing the roots now what's the coefficient of uh, lambda to the power n here if i expand this out that's actually very easy how do you get the lambda to the power n you'll get one lambda from here one lambda from here and so on and the nth lambda from here all of them co will come with uh, coefficient one so what's the coefficient of lambda to the power n it is just one but i also wrote the characteristic polynomial as a minus lambda i the determinant so if i think about it i have terms like a1 one, one minus lambda a1 a2 two, 2 minus lambda and so on in the matrix a n n minus lambda and i have some other terms all over the place so this is my huge matrix and it's the determinant of that matrix that i'm looking at if i expand it and lambdas will come only from the diagonal so that's the only place where you have lambdas and if i expand that there will be a term because if i'm expanding it along the first row it's the minor is actually the determinant of uh, this guy here and then that determinant will have another minor that is here so all the minors will have the leading element which is a uh, aii minus lambda if i multiply it out there will be one term that basically reads a11 minus lambda a12 minus lambda all the way up to a n n minus lambda plus some other 
things after that. Okay, there'll be other things after that. But from this, can you see the coefficient of lambda to the power n will be? It is plus or minus 1. To be more precise, it's going to be minus 1 to the power n, depending on how many n's you have. So if I want to say, I want to say this is the left-hand side and that is my right-hand side, I want to equate them, then I have to make sure that the coefficient of lambda to the power n is the same. So I can write a minus lambda i is equal to minus 1 to the power n and the product of all those terms there and that will be in the shorthand notation f pi i equal to 1 to n that is a product of lambda minus lambda i so i can always write it that way now we talked about the coefficient of lambda to the power n what's the coefficient of lambda to the power n minus 1 lambda to the power n minus 1 in the expansion of the blue polynomial or blue factorized polynomial in the top plus 5 times lambda plus 6. What's the coefficient of lambda here? So lambda, the expansion is quadratic, so there will be terms in lambda squared, lambda, and constant. What's the coefficient of, of lambda here? 11, because this is basically 5 plus 6. Well, let me take one more, lambda plus 1. In that case, what's the coefficient of uh, lambda squared here? It's going to be 12 in this case. So similarly, the coefficient of lambda to the power n minus 1 in this case is going to be the sum of lambda i's, sum of eigenvalues. And what's the coefficient of lambda to the power n minus 1 in the red area here, in the red polynomial that I've written down here? That is going to be the sum of a11, a22, a33, a and n. It will be the, basically the sum of the matrix elements because that's where lambda to the power n minus 1 will come. Coefficients of left hand side and right hand side, lambda to the power n will have a coefficient of minus 1 to the power n. Lambda to the power n minus 1 on the left hand side will have the trace which is a sum of uh, all the, the diagonal elements of the matrix because a11 plus a22 plus a33 etc. On the right hand side it will be the sum of the eigenvalues so they have to be the same because this equality is a statement of truth and that means each coefficient will have to match. All right so that is the statement so the proof is right here just by comparing the coefficient of lambda to the power n minus 1 on the left hand side you get the trace on the right hand side you will get the sum of the eigenvalues now that proof of that statement has a corollary that states that for a real matrix a the trace is always real because all elements are real that means if you have complex eigenvalues they have to appear in complex conjugate pairs so that the imaginary part will cancel off that is one property quite important and quite interesting the second property is actually interesting also but easier to prove the product of the eigenvalues that i've written down here and that is the determinant of the matrix and again that uh, goes back to the same statement the same statement here a the characteristic polynomial on the left hand side is a minus lambda i the determinant on the right hand side i'm just expanding it in terms of the roots and this is again a statement of truth should hold for all values of lambda because it's an equation and in particular i can put lambda equal to zero and on the left hand side i'll get a determinant of a on the right hand side minus one to the power n and a product of n entities minus lambda i so there's minus one to the power n coming up again so that will cancel off to one so that is just a product of the eigenvalues but this also has a corollary which states that if you have a singular matrix we know that the determinant has to be zero that means at least one of the eigenvalues will have to be zero so the eigenvalues will tell you something about the structure of the matrix the arithmetic structure of the matrix the trace the determinant the singularity etc quite interesting another set of uh, properties eigenvalues of real symmetric matrices are real and the proof is there in the textbook so what we are saying is that it's a real matrix square transpose is the same as itself so it's symmetric and that implies that the eigenvalues are all real the opposite the converse of this also is true the eigenvalues of real skew symmetric matrices are purely imaginary which is what we saw for uh, the rotation matrix so if a transpose is minus a then lambda i will be such that its uh, complex conjugate is minus the number so remember the complex conjugate for a plus sub b i the complex conjugate will be just changing the sign of i is a minus b i and if the complex conjugate is a minus of uh, the original number that means it's purely imaginary 
the imaginary part change the sign. There's one more set of properties. If you scale a matrix by alpha, the eigenvalues will scale by the same factor alpha. So if A has eigenvalues lambda i, the eigenvalues of uh, alpha times A would be alpha times lambda i. This is fairly easy to prove. So what we have is A is equal to lambda s because lambda is an eigenvalue. And if I just multiply both sides by alpha, I get alpha times a s is equal to alpha times lambda times s and then you can see that this matrix call it b or a prime has an eigenvector s with the eigenvalue alpha times lambda next one also is easy to prove if you shift a matrix by alpha i'll tell you what shifting means the eigenvalues will get shifted by alpha if you take a and add alpha times i to it that is what we mean by shifting the matrix shift the diagonal elements by alpha then the eigenvalues of that shifted matrix will be lambda i plus alpha where lambda i are the eigenvalues of the original matrix a so again easy to prove so we have a is equal to lambda i times s for some eigenvector corresponding to lambda i now i just add alpha i to a and multiply by s so i expand it out i get a s plus alpha i s so that is lambda i s because a s is lambda i s and then i have alpha s because i multiplying s will give me just s and then i can pull out s i'll get this guy again if you call the matrix a plus alpha i a prime some other matrix then that multiplying the same eigenvector will give me some constant times the same eigenvector but the eigenvalues will get shifted by alpha so these are things that might be important in developing algorithms for computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now let me tell you the properties of eigenvectors. This is an interesting property. Eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are linearly independent. That means if you have a matrix, a square matrix A, and you have some eigenvectors, and if I have two eigenvalues lambda sub i and lambda sub j, then if, if lambda i sub i is not equal to lambda sub j, that means si and uh, sj are going to be linearly independent that means you won't be able to find a linear combination such that the linear combination is zero without the coefficient being zero this is uh, proven in the textbook again now the thing is it actually applies not merely to real matrices it actually applies to the complex uh, matrices too because the proof actually involves complex fields another thing that we mentioned earlier real symmetric matrices have full set of orthogonal eigenvectors and that means if a transpose is equal to a for a real symmetric matrix then the eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other again proven in the textbook the eigenvectors of a shifted matrix a plus alpha i are the same as those of uh, a so we prove this a plus alpha i times s is going to be equal to lambda plus alpha times s so eigenvalues get shifted by the same factor alpha but the eigenvectors are the same now the last one that is actually about eigenvalues i put it as the last one because this one i don't have a proof for so for a real symmetric matrix again the number of positive eigenvalues is the same as the number of positive pivots so if you do gaussian elimination without any uh, scaling you scale of course you can change the sign of the pivots without any scaling if you just do gaussian elimination then the number of positive pivots will be the same as number of positive eigenvalues the number of negative pivots will be the number of negative eigenvalues combine that with the fact that you can shift the eigenvalues then what you can do is to take a matrix find the number of positive and negative pivots and then shift it by a little bit and then see the number of positive pivots and negative pivots again and that way you can zero in on on the eigenvalues because the moment the number changes then you know that uh, you have crossed the value of one eigenvalue in terms of alpha and that can be used as the basis of an algorithm to compute the eigenvalues this is not a very good algorithm this is not the way it is implemented there are better algorithms now so this property connecting the the sign of the pivots to the sign of the eigenvalues is called sylvester's law of inertia this has got something to do with mechanical engineering or physics or something one thing that is important for you to know is why we're doing this eigen analysis so in order to show you that let's talk about what a matrix does to a vector or all vectors so let's take a matrix a matrix that is given here 5 by 4 minus root 3 by 4 minus root 3 by 4 3 by 4 as we know by now 
what that matrix does to the unit vectors q1 and q2, 1, 0 and 0, 1, will be the columns of uh, A. The first column will be what q1 will become. 0, 1 when transformed will become the second column of the matrix A. So now we know what it does to these two vectors, but it looks quite complicated. So if I take other vectors, other unit vectors in the unit circle, suppose I have a unit circle there, so I'm taking other vectors on the unit circle so that the magnitude is the same and transforming each one of them, what will happen is that you will get a bunch of vectors, transformed vectors, whose tips are on the ellipse as shown here. But to understand the ellipse, it's not very easy. So it has, you have some direction somewhere, A1 in light red and A2 in light blue, and then you have an ellipse, but nothing is specified about the ellipse. But if you do the eigen analysis, it will find for you the axis of the ellipse. So the first eigen vector that comes out of this eigen analysis is actually along the axis of this ellipse. And the second eigen vector is along the axis, the other axis of the ellipse. And the length of the axis will be the eigen value. So in this case, the dark red eigen vector, it is normalized. So it's uh, on the unit circle that points in the direction of the major axis of this ellipse. And the, the size of the major axis is just the eigenvalue lambda 1. The blue eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue will be lambda 2 and S2. So that's what it is doing. So it's basically specifying the ellipse to which a unit circle gets transformed by the matrix. That is actually enough to specify everything that is happening because of the matrix. So basically eigen analysis will specify and help you understand what a matrix does. So if you have the columns of the matrix AI and if you have the identity matrix where the columns are QI, those are the unit vectors, what the matrix does to the unit vectors in the identity matrix is what it's going to do to every other vector. So it maps the unit vectors to its columns. So A is a mapping of the unit vectors QI to AI. So it will take the unit circle by which I mean every vector point into any point on the unit circle will become a point on the ellipse. So it will transform those vectors to vectors whose tips are on the ellipse. Okay, So that's what it's going to do in R2. But if you go to Rn, then instead of a unit circle, you have a unit hypersphere. There is a hyper ellipsoid. So that is a transformation. So that is an extrapolation to higher dimensions. Now we need to know what the ellipsoid is in terms of its orientation, which would be the the eigenvectors and we need to know the size of the ellipsoid that would those would be the eigenvalues. So eigenvectors will give us the principal axis. Even at this point you can ask the question why do we want to know the principal axis and uh, the size of the ellipsoid etc. So let me give you a concrete example here. So in data science if you have a data set which is a matrix if you consider a data let's take the concrete example of uh, the height, weight and length of hair. Suppose I take the average in each column, which is like just adding up and dividing by the number of observations. So I get one row of averages. Now suppose I subtract it from each row. So I take the average in each column, the mean of each column, I subtract it out from each entry. And now suppose I plot it again. Suppose I take one column of uh, say height and I plot after taking out the mean. What do you think the mean of that plot will be? If I have weight, that is one column, then I have height and length of hair. I have some numbers here, W1, W2, up to Wn, and I take its mean, so that would be W sum divided by n, and then I go back and subtract it out of each one of the Ws, new W prime, W1 prime is equal to W1 minus this, let me call that uh, W minus the mean, and now Suppose I make a plot or suppose I compute the mean of W, W prime. So the mean, I add up all the W1 prime, W2 prime, etc. and divide by N. What do you think that mean will be? That's going to be zero because I basically took out the mean. That process is called zero centering the data. So I can do that for each column here. So I zero center the data. Now suppose this data matrix I call that A after zero centering. And now I take A transpose A. This will be a three by three matrix. This is the gram matrix, by the way. That is going to be the covariance matrix of the data. So we can actually do this, uh, just write down the equation and compare it to the covariance equation in uh, statistics. And you will see that it's actually the covariance matrix. Each entry in that three by three matrix will be the covariance between the corresponding variables. So the diagonal elements will be the variance and the off diagonal elements will be the covariance. Suppose I run 
the eigen analysis on the covariance matrix then i'll get an ellipse the direction along which you have the largest eigenvalue is the largest and that particular direction captures the largest amount of the variance in the data that particular linear combination of the features will capture the largest amount of the, the variance in the data so instead of working with the weight height and the length of hair i might work with a linear combination specified by the eigenvector and that will give me the largest uh, covariance so the, i might be able to get away by using just one variable in a in my model because that might give me let's say 80 percent of the variance and suppose i'm happy with 80% of the variance being explained by my model. If that is enough, then that will be a good strategy for reducing the dimensionality of the problem. In fact, if you have say 150 different features and if you want to reduce the dimensionality to say 10, this is exactly what you will do. You will compute the covariance matrix and will run an eigenvalue analysis on it and will take the top 15 or 10 or 15 of the, the eigenvalues and then take the corresponding directions as the directions along which you have the largest variance and that might be enough that might capture 99% of the variance in the data and your model might explain a large part of it. This is a good strategy and this is actually what is being done in singular value decomposition and the associated principal component analysis. But as you can see the amount of variance that you can potentially describe by your model that is related to the coefficient of determination coming from statistics. Remember coefficient of determination r square is actually the fraction of the variance that is explained by your model. This is the basis of dimensionality reduction and there is one more application not necessarily for data science projects but for mathematical modeling in, in other applications. So that is uh, diagonalization. So right in the beginning I said eigenvalue decomposition will help you write the matrix A as a product of three matrices in which the middle one is actually diagonal. So suppose I want to write A as some matrix S and uh, some matrix which is completely diagonal so lambda and s inverse so i'm reusing the letters s and lambda so it's got something to do with the eigenvectors and eigenvalues so if you can write it in this form this is actually a very good situation to be in in any kind of a chain or difference equation kind of modeling of a system so if you describe the system as a vector and you say that at every step at every iteration the system changes by a matrix multiplication it changes into something else so at step zero you have x zero at uh, step one you have x one i have some system and it is fully described by a vector x zero which got a large number of components measurements of the system maybe and that is at uh, time t zero time instant or time sequence number t zero and in order to get x one that is going to be a x zero suppose that is x one so evolution of the system is a model by the matrix multiplication a and which depends only on the previous state and if i want to get uh, x2 then that will be a x1 that will be x2 which is the same as a square x0 so you have to square the matrix this kind of modeling by the way in which the state of the system depends only on the previous state nothing beyond that the memory is only one step that is called a markov chain kind of modeling there's another model called hidden markov model which is also based on this kind of idea and that is used in uh, text analytics in uh, parts of speech tagging of words etc so what i'm trying to say here is if you keep going suppose you want to know xk that is basically going to be equal to a to the power k x0 so you need you may need to take powers of the matrix now if you can write the matrix in this uh, decomposed form taking a square will mean multiplying this twice and in between what you have is s inverse s which becomes i so that dis disappears and then you have lambda square lambda square is a lot easier to compute compared to a square because lambda is a diagonal matrix and the square you just take the diagonal elements and square it so a to the power k will be just two matrix multiplications and an exponentiation of the diagonal elements of uh, one matrix so which is a lot easier to do than multiplying a k times without diagonalization if a is an n by n matrix the best algorithm we have to do the, the multiplication, the complexity is of the order n to the power 2.3. And if I have to do it k times, then it's k times n to the power 2.3 operations. That is what you will need with diagonalization. It takes only two matrix multiplications, so that costs me 2 times 2 n to the power 2.3. And then I have not k but n exponentiation because I have 
n elements in the diagonal of lambda, I have to raise each one of them to the power k. Let me call that n operations. Then that total is n plus 2 times n to the power 2.3. And if you compute the, the saving, you will see that it is actually k by 2. If I want to take say 100 power of a, I save a factor of 50 in that uh, operation if I had diagonalization. So if I would take say 50 minutes to compute the multiplication, it will take only one minute to compute the same thing using diagonalization plus maybe a little bit of time to actually do the diagonalization but that's negligible. So that is a kind of a thing that you can get by diagonalization in specifically from the perspective of, uh, of computer science savings in terms of computational complexity. So why take powers? It's a common technique in uh, difference equations and Markov chains that I just described. In fact you can define exponentiation of matrices through Taylor series expansion and that is actually used in solving differential equations, but that's not part of this course. So difference equation that I showed you just now basically says that the kth state depends only on the k minus 1 state through a matrix multiplication. And if I expand it, xk actually depends on the original state x0 by a to the power k, which you can actually use our uh, diagonalization to, to uh, compute very easily with the saving of k by 2 operations, a factor of k by 2. So it's a common method to model mathematically using difference equation and which are computed iteratively. So that much for the motivation. What we do is we start with the eigenvalue equation a times si is equal to lambda i times si. So si is an eigenvector of a with the eigenvalue lambda i. So that is the statement there. And suppose I arrange all these eigenvalues in a matrix s as columns then I go ahead and arrange all the eigenvalues as the diagonal elements in another matrix a square matrix n by n matrix like that if I do that then suppose I compute a times s so a times s will be a times the matrix s which has uh, columns s1 s2 s3 standing there and as you know from the block multiplication from the first chapter that is basically distributing a inside and applying it to each one of the columns. So I'll get AS1, AS2, A up to ASN. But SI is a eigen vector of A with the eigenvalue lambda sub i. So I'll get lambda 1, S1, lambda 2, S2, lambda i, SI, lambda n, SN. Like that. So that is one side. Let me call that the LHS. Now if I look at the other side, suppose I take S times lambda. So S is just the vector S1, S2, S3 up to SN. And I have lambda, which is a diagonal matrix. If I do the multiplication, what will happen is something like I have S1. I'll just take two eigenvectors. That is my S matrix. And my lambda is a lambda 1 and lambda 2 and 0 here, 0 here. In order to get the first column of the product, I'll take lambda 1 times the first uh, column and 0 times the, the second column. So that product will become lambda 1 s1 and the second one similarly I'll take the 0 times the first column and lambda 2 times the second column I'll get lambda 2 s2. The product s lambda if I extrapolate that to n vectors standing side by side is the same as uh, a matrix with lambda 1 s1 lambda 2 s2 up to lambda n sn standing side by side. So that's what I put there. So s lambda is lambda 1 s1 lambda 2 s2. If I compare that with as which also is the same thing. So this guy is the same as that. Then you can see that they are the same. So I can say confidently that A is equal to S lambda. So A is equal to S lambda. That is always true, regardless of uh, how many eigenvectors you have, what algebraic multiplicity is and uh, geometric multiplicity. All those things are irrelevant because whatever we did, we did not make any assumption. A is equal to S lambda is always true, which means if I multiply both sides by A again, what will happen on this side? A s is equal to s lambda. I put s lambda there and I multiply by uh, a again and I get a square. And then on the other side, lambda just gets a uh, square. So a to the power k s is equal to s times lambda to the power k. That also is always true. Now, if I make an assumption that s is invertible, what that means is that we have n linearly independent eigenvectors. If that is the case, then I can take s to the other side. I can multiply both sides with s inverse a s is equal to a s is equal to s lambda always true but if s is invertible i can multiply both sides with uh, s inverse or a s s inverse is equal to s lambda s inverse 
and this chi becomes a i and that just goes away so a is equal to s lambda s inverse and which is which was the decomposition that we are looking for so that decomposition is possible if s is a uh, invertible so if you can find the linearly independent eigenvectors then you can write that but if you can find linearly independent eigenvectors then you can use that as a basis also so there is a nice basis called the eigenbasis so any vector in rn because i have n linearly independent eigenvectors can be expressed as a linear combination of the eigenvectors so if i call that linear combination with uh, scalars ci then i can see that x0 is actually just the matrix s times c which is a vector so that vector c would be the vector x0 expressed in the eigenbasis why would you want to do that because the difference equation xk which is the kth state of the system was a to the power k times x0 and if x0 is actually sc then a to the power k s as you can see here is just s lambda to the power k so it just becomes that which is easy to compute this guy is hard to compute but this guy is very easy to compute so the diagonalization is a process of getting a in this form and this since it is a decomposition a factorization this is also called eigenvalue decomposition or evd for short that is a pretty interesting and uh, very useful decomposition now let's look at uh, one fun application of uh, eigen analysis so it's the fibonacci series the fibonacci sequence of numbers it happens in nature all the time in terms of uh, the spirals and uh, uh, spirals going in opposite directions or stuff like that on pineapples and uh, sunflowers and all that okay so that is the fibonacci sequence and it's got very interesting properties in interesting uh, sequence is very easy to compute k plus 2 element is uh, the sum of the previous two k plus 1 and the kth elements sum them up it is if you think about it it's like uh, like a markov chain instead of depending only on the previous uh, step it depends on two steps so it's a second order difference equation if you want to be very uh, formal about giving it the right name now the question that you might ask ourselves is how fast are these numbers growing these numbers are obviously growing is one one two three five eight and it doesn't look like there is any clear way in which you can compute how fast these numbers are growing and even more impressive can you come up with an approximation for the kth fibonacci number that also doesn't look at all obvious here but eigenvalue decomposition the eigen analysis will tell you that it is actually possible of course in order to have to do anything to do with eigenvalues and uh, eigenvectors obviously you need to have a matrix and we don't have any here yet so we will create first order matrix equation so a second order difference equation will become a first order matrix equation let me consider a vector which has two elements a fibonacci number and the previous fibonacci number k plus one and k and if i do that then if i want to compute the next vector that is x sub k plus one so wherever i see k i'm going to put uh, k plus one so k plus one plus one and k plus one here so i get that now i get f k plus two uh, as the first element but i know that f k plus two is f k plus one plus f k so i put that in there then suddenly i can see a matrix there I can see that the k plus 1 state, that vector, is actually the kth vector, the kth vector times a matrix. So oh, that is my matrix A. It's a 1, 1, 1, 0. And then I can go ahead and do the eigen analysis. I write the characteristic equation, A minus uh, lambda i, the determinant of. And I get that and expand out the determinant, 1 minus lambda times minus lambda minus 1 and do a bit of a basic algebra then i get lambda square minus lambda minus one equal to zero that quadratic equation is just about the most famous quadratic equation in the world the most significant one but before telling you why that is the case let's compare that equation lambda square lambda and one coming with uh, minus signs there and compare it to our second order equation there and take everything to one side so f k plus two minus f k plus one minus fk so k plus 2 that is second order k plus 1 that is first order k that is the zeroth order and the, the right sign and right coefficients so that is actually the characteristic equation actually captures the essence of uh, the fibonacci sequence from the properties of uh, eigenvalues that we talked about some of the eigenvalues of the matrix a will be the same as the trace which is what is the trace here one and uh, the product will be the same as the determinant what's the determinant here 
minus 1. But we have the characteristic equation and this is a quadratic equation. We know how to solve it. So I just solve it. You will get lambda is equal to 1 plus or minus square root of 5 divided by 2. That number again is actually a very famous one, especially the positive one. So lambda 1 is 1.618 and that is actually the golden ratio. 1 plus square root of 5 divided by 2 golden ratio again something that appears in all kinds of aesthetic kind of uh, stuff like paintings mm -hmm. architecture has got very important uh, properties in terms of uh, of uh, how we perceive things apparently but as you will see it is also significant in terms of fibonacci numbers so there's a connection between fibonacci numbers and this golden ratio which is interesting so lambda one is actually the golden ratio now the absolute value of lambda one is more than one the absolute value of lambda two is less than one so the statement i'm going to make is that the sequence is going to grow as lambda one because that is the what we call the dominant eigenvalue because that is the highest in terms of absolute value and it is more than one so the system is actually going to grow exponentially and the growth rate is going to be 1.618 so that means if, you, if i take the 100th Fibonacci number divided by the 99th Fibonacci number that ratio is going to be very close to lambda 1 that is my statement in order to see why we will have to look at uh, the vector that we constructed which had remember fk plus 1 and fk we can express that in the eigen vector basis with some coefficients we don't really need to know the eigen vectors yet we just need to know that it can be expressed I, I have two eigenvectors they are orthogonal to each other and I can express any vector in particular I can express x0 which was uh, just uh, 0 1 I believe or 1 0 rather in terms of uh, the eigenvectors and then I know that xk is going to be a to the power k times that x0 which means it's going to be c1 times a to the power k s1 c2 times a to the power k s2 and since s1 and s2 are eigenvectors i know that a to the power k s1 is the same as lambda 1 to the power k s1 and the second one is lambda 2 to the power k s2 so this we already saw now look at lambda 1 that absolute value is more than 1 lambda 2 absolute value is less than 1 so as k grows as k becomes like 10 or 15 or 100 this guy is going to just disappear because lambda 2 to the power k is going to be a very small number but lambda 1 to the power k on the other hand is going to be a large number so we can ignore this guy and we can say regardless of what s1 is and regardless of what that coefficient is we know that xk is going to grow in accordance with the dominant eigenvalue so xk is kind of similar to that which grows as uh, the dominant eigenvalue if you want to actually know what exactly that Fibonacci number is as an approximation the Fibonacci numbers are going to grow as the golden ratio which means the 100th Fibonacci number divided by the 99th Fibonacci number is actually going to be the golden ratio 1.618 whatever but if you want to actually be able to compute the 100th Fibonacci number as an approximation then we need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors eigenvalues we already have but we need to know the eigenvectors and we need to express x0 our starting vector the starting state vector in terms of uh, the eigenvectors in the basis of uh, eigenvectors in the eigenbasis we can actually see that uh, the eigenvectors s1 is lambda 1 1 and s2 is lambda 2 1 that is easy to see okay so this is what i want to do if i take s is equal to lambda and 1 what do i get i get uh, lambda minus lambda square plus 1 in the top and in the bottom i get uh, lambda and minus lambda and the, the second element is obviously 0 the first element is actually the characteristic equation remember our characteristic equation was lambda square minus lambda minus 1 equal to 0 when multiplied by minus 1 you get uh, the top one so that also is equal to 0 eigenvectors are of the form of this so i have lambda 1 1 as 1 1 eigenvector i call that s1 and lambda 2 1 as a second eigenvector i call that s2 we know that the approximation for xk is whatever linear combination we have for x0 and we ignore the second term there s2 is ignored because that is going to be multiplied by lambda 2 to the power k and so we need to worry only about s1 and if i do all the multiplication out and expand it i'll get f k plus 1 is equal to c1 lambda 1 to the power k plus 1 fk is equal to c1 lambda 1 to the power k and obviously fk plus 1 divided by fk is of course lambda 1 which is a golden ratio but as you can see fk is just c1 
lambda 1 to the power k so we need to find c1 also and then we have an approximation for fk c1 lambda 1 to the power k so what is c1 in order to get c1 we look at uh, x0 and that is a uh, 1 0 so the first Fibonacci number is a 1 the 0 the 1 is 0 in our sequence and we express that as a linear combination of the eigenvectors so I have that and that basically gives me two equations c1 lambda 1 plus c2 lambda 2 is equal to 1 that is the first one and c1 plus c2 is equal to 0 that is the second one two equations and we know we are experts in solving equations of that kind and so I'll get c1 is equal to 1 divided by square root of 5 so fk the kth fibonacci number is 1 by square root of 5 coming from c1 and lambda 1 was uh, the golden ratio to the power k so i have an expression there for the kth fibonacci number a numeric expression it depends only on k and this is actually surprisingly extremely accurate by the time you reach the fifth fibonacci number of, or something like that you will see that the error in the approximation is uh, a few parts in a million it is very very accurate so that is the application of uh, eigen analysis in something that was a series of numbers a very famous series of numbers but a series nonetheless of course this is only an academic uh, exercise but similar applications can be uh, seen in uh, other kinds of different equations and how systems evolve and you will see that the approximation is actually a very good one let me wrap it up very quickly so we looked at uh, the eigen analysis and the significance definitions and significance vectors that scale when transformed rather than change orientation those would be the eigen vectors and it gives insights about what the matrix does especially in the data space that would be principal component ana analysis which can be used for dimensionality reduction so there are many many ways in which uh, eigen analysis is used in uh, physics and engineering and we looked at uh, eigen analysis for small matrices example matrices and we looked at characteristic polynomial and then some properties and diagonalizability and the uses of diagonalization we looked at it and then an example an academics example in fibonacci numbers so one thing about uh, systems where you have uh, eigen values for the system would be to predict where the system is stable is it growing or is it shrinking or is it oscillating between states those things will be described by the sign and the size of the eigenvalues Sylvester's rule a starting point for uh, some eigenvalue analysis a transpose a we saw many many times that the gram matrix is a very good matrix 